It's really fun to be involved in a women-led industry with so many female entrepreneurs who are looking to solve the, the issues of a female consumer, which we understand quite well. This is exciting that women are really leading the space and owning the space. Um, and obviously when I say women, please know I'm including those who identify as women in an inclusive space. So by Welcome to Mangtas Nation Season 2. This season is all about tech of the future. We'll be sharing real-world experiences and featuring astounding guests to help guide you in your tech journey. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. The show starts right now. Hello everyone, this is Jackie DeMenk together with Wouter DeBare and welcome to the Mangtas Nation podcast. In today's episode, we're thrilled to have a very special guest all the way from Singapore. She's a high value customer service consultant and the founder and CEO of 1B Consulting, who has made a significant impact in the industry. While working on a client's DEI project, she recognized a gap in the market and identified a need for an industry association for those working or investing in women's health and technology space, uh, the femtech industry. She then founded the Femtech Association of Asia, which has since driven collaborations globally to raise awareness of the region's femtech industry, entrepreneurs, and businesses. Listeners, for International Women's Month, let us welcome Lindsay Davis. Hey, Lindsay, welcome to the show. Hi, Jackie and Walter. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and to get to celebrate March, International Women's Month with you. So thank you for having me. Fantastic. The pleasure is all ours, Lindsay. Now, uh, well, you know, before we dive into into more of the conversation, let's just start start simply. And uh, can you tell us uh, and our listeners a bit about yourself and your background? Of course, of course. So I have now lived in Singapore for about three years, but have done quite a bit of business here over the years. Before this, I was in London for about fourteen years, and before that, uh, a couple other countries and the U.S. Actually, for kind of childhood and growing up. So I am from Wisconsin originally, and then moved to Texas, where I went to school at the University of Texas in Austin. So I'm a, a Longhorn, as, as we like to say, um, as my alma mater, and then <laughs> now have kind of shifted from my work in luxury across the US and the UK, and have now moved into still doing a bit of that work, but with a primary mm -hmm. focus on women's health and technology or femtech, through, as you mentioned, the Femtech Association of Asia, and really kind of uniting um, over nine countries now that we have and over 50 companies nice. um, that, yeah, that are, that are in this space. So really trying to, to make impact through solutions, products, AI, healthcare apps, telemedicine, you know, all of these different types of categories and really just making an impact for women's health. So, so before we talk a little bit more about the organization and the objectives and all the good stuff you're doing, um, when you say world of luxury, what does that mean exactly? Sure. Well, I uh, started with working in the advertising space, so in, in advertising agencies. So um, I was always on the accounts side, which is, of course, a lot of fun um, and a lot of you know really good cast of characters I've worked with over the years and also some really special brands. What I found in time is that more and more I was working on um, kind of VIP propositions, so loyalty programs or high value clients, high spending clients, kind of that top 1%. So when I shifted um, initially from my, ad my advertising agency world, I knew I wanted to move to the client side uh, more than kind of the agency side and ended up at a company in London that specialized in luxury uh, and lifestyle management. So more around luxury service and luxury experiences. So from London, I actually managed around 60 businesses um, internationally. Um, so our franchise network in the luxury space, which in and of itself is quite unique for a luxury brand, but mm -hmm. moreover looking at um, kind of all elements and all aspects of the brand. So everything from kind of business development all the way through to implementation and, and ongoing um, advice management, you know, kind of almost an internal consultant for the business through international operations helping these businesses set up, train, uh, recruit new members, 
um, and really help with their brand development and brand management globally. But most importantly, the customer experience, because obviously when we're talking about luxury brands and uh, customers or clients that these brands are dealing with, that customer experience is going to be need to be impeccable. Fantastic. But um, well, Lindsay, going back to femtech for like for people or especially women who don't know what uh, the femtech industry is, can you tell us a little bit more about that and uh, especially about why it's important? Thank you so much for asking that question. I love that you said, and tell us more about the importance of it as well. So it's not just about awareness; it's actually about the understanding mm -hmm. of the industry. So we've all heard of fintech, we've all heard of yes. sus tech, agri tech, um, even health tech. So moving into kind of a, a smaller category of health tech, we're looking at femtech or female mm -hmm. technology. So the coin was termed in, in the term was coined, excuse me, in 2016 by Ida Tin, who is the founder of Clue, which is a period tracking app. So the whole idea is that female technology, of course, is around a lot of the tech elements like we talked about earlier, uh, mobile, mm -hmm. you know, uh, mobile apps or AI. But it also has started to move into other areas like fem health and fem care. So, for instance, you know, a sustainable uh, period wellness brand or menstrual wellness brand may not, of course, have technology involved outside of the e-commerce space online. However, I think there's a lot of legs that these businesses can grow more into the tech space. So, when we talk about femtech. We're talking about a global market size that has a big range. We're looking at everything from 22 billion to 40.2 billion I've seen in the press as the estimated uh, market market size uh, with a quote of 60.1 billion by 2027 and average pay of about 15% a year. So when we talk about why it's important, uh, the second part of your question, um, we are looking at a lot of different reasons. First of all, obviously women, half of the population, if not 51%, yeah. as I often see. So we're looking at really an underserved uh, customer base or community, we could even say. But I, I like to think of it as, of course, social impact is part of, of femtech, but really the point is it's a business. Just as fintech or agritech, sustech, any of mm -hmm. these other are, are, are businesses. So when we're looking at what's important, one, it's providing women with more options and ownership for their health. And then when we look for investment, we're looking at offering investors new opportunities for kind of early investment and long-term investment, looking at a market that's been just tremendously untapped and, and, and underrepresented over a, a long period of time. Uh, one more thing I would say about Femtech is that it's historically, women's health has been very under-researched. So along mm -hmm. with being underserved, also under-researched. So one of the challenges we have is, is really um, improving our data sets and building our, our, our data analysis and insights. And that's another re reason why it's important is that we feel like we can help more women with more opportunities through Femtech and the solutions, the products, um, and the systems that we create that support women's health. But in your in your life's journey, Lindsay, you know, from, from, uh, from America to London and now in Singapore, what inspired you in between to start the Femtech Association of Asia? And uh, like, what are some of your goals for your for the organization? Sure. Well, I, you know, I think we all look back in time and start connecting the dots on our careers. And one thing that I've always seen is I've loved working with a lot of people and very diverse, you know, very diverse people from all over the world doing all kinds of things. So first of all, I yeah, love you practically diverse. covered the the continents. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Almost, I still have a few more. Um, but you know, I just I love I love the diversity of this amazing world and getting to work with so many talented entrepreneurs or vendors or or clients around the world. So I think. That is the, the first thing that I've, I've enjoyed an international career for that reason. It's just selfishly, I love getting to explore and meet so many people. As far as what the common thread is, though, I tend to have a real passion for community building and a real skill for community building. So, you know, a lot of people say, oh, gosh, you know, you've moved around the world so many times. And I, I guess at this point, I think I've lived in, you know, kind of four or five countries and, and done secondments long term in a bunch of different countries. So I think it's the idea that I really enjoy Kind of building communities from scratch and i really enjoy um helping those communities make impact in whatever their passion is now i did see a gap here in that in in, in the us we kind of see a little bit more momentum in the femtech space but here in asia we didn't have that unity and representation yet 
So I kind of thought, oh, well, there's a great community that I can build. And, and, and the more I, I explored, the more I saw just a massive gap in, in everything from uh, fewer businesses over here, fewer entrepreneurs in the space, yeah. fewer investors in the space. Um, and, and just no one was really talking about it when I first moved here. So it's exciting to kind of help be the voice for Asia of Femtech, despite being over six foot tall and blonde. So you know, <laughs> I, I consider myself, you know, a, a, a voice, but certainly not uh, an expert in the region. I would always leave my, you know, my counterparts and my members yeah. and our, our investors and our vendors to, to, you know, to share what what uh, different countries in Asia feel. My job is just to kind of bring people together, unify and bring together some thought leadership, some programming, um, some amplification for the industry and the companies we have, the amazing entrepreneurs we have, and of course, build that community and network, uh, not only here in Asia, but you know, really connect us to that global ecosystem that's developing so rapidly. Amazing, amazing. And uh, you know, I, I'm sure some experts also don't consider themselves experts. So at a certain point, you know, nobody, nobody would really admit if you if you know so much. There's still so much that you still have to learn. But the and talking about member members in in the organization, can you share a bit about your your membership? Like how how you get women to to be involved in in the organization and who are, who your target demographics are or what the countries are you you expanding into in Asia or categories that are represented and etc. Great, great, great. So lots to cover there when we talk about just, <laughs> you know, the amazing skill and the brilliant leaders that we have in our association. So right now we're about 80% female, which is which is a similar trend around the world that, you know, who's going to be talking about, you know, menstrual care, menopause, mm -hmm. fertility, reproductive health, pregnancy, health The experts. Care. <laughs> the experts. I love it. Exactly. So it's a really fun industry. Not me, that's for sure. That's right. That's right. No, but having said that, we have, tw you know, 20% of our founders in the Femtech Association of Asia are men. And what we find actually is that um, more and more men are getting involved. And a lot of the businesses that we've seen investment in have co-founders that are men and males. So, you know, it, it's, it's, I think it is an inclusive space. Um, but, to, you know, to, to, to Jackie's earlier point, I think it's, it's really fun to be involved in a women-led industry with so many female entrepreneurs who are looking to solve the, the issues of a female consumer, which we understand quite well. So, I, you know, it's a really positive thing. And I see this as exciting that women are really leading the space and owning the space. Um, and obviously, mm -hmm. when I say women, please know I'm including those who identify as women in an inclusive space. So by no means excluding anyone. So to answer your question about uh, categories that we represent. Now, one thing that is really interesting is the Femtech Association of Asia actually sees menstrual health and wellness as the, the number one represented, uh, represented companies. But number two category is actually sexual wellness and sexual health. Now, a lot of times I say that's surprising because we tend to talk about taboos. We tend to talk mm -hmm. about stigma. And what we're actually finding is that women um, are, are very aware of their needs and they're very aware of their health. And that's all health, mental health, physical health, relationship health, uh, financial health, sexual health. Mm -hmm. So, you know, bringing that together, I, I just really think it shows that, you know, categories that are that are in demand are the categories, you know, consumers are asking for. So it's exciting to see so many of these businesses um, growing and, and being established. As far as what we'd love to see more of categories wise, we'd love to see more menopause companies and hormonal health. We'd love to see more chronic illness based companies. You know, an example being that 70% of chronic illnesses is suffered by women, but 80% of pain research is conducted on men. So we can see that we really need, you know, women to be represented in that research and those clinical trials, as we talked about earlier. I think along with those two, would love to see um, a bit more around fertility. I think there's a lot of white space mm -hmm. over here for, for really, you know, creating amazing companies. And then one thing that we've seen consistent with all of our companies, no matter what category they're in, is the importance of education and community building, creating you know, knowledge for people and giving people information that they can trust, and also building communities that people feel like they have a safe space and can meet people who have their problems. Because sometimes we don't talk about our, our problems in you know, like polycystic ovary uh, syndrome or irregular periods. Mm. We might not discuss that regularly, but how wonderful to have a space in a community to discuss these among our members, our customers, and even investors are starting to get involved, which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, indeed, it does sound very exciting. And when you talk about communities, Lindsay, like for our listeners who may have their own questions or, or concerns or would just like to join some of your communities, where are your most active communities and how can they be a part of it? Sure. Well, we have Singapore, what we have really worked hard to establish as the hub of femtech mm-hmm. in Asia. So we see over half of our femtech businesses throughout Asia that we are aware of and have done the research to find and invited as well to, to, the, to our uh, association. 50% and slightly more are based out of Singapore. Having said that, we're seeing a lot of outreach from Indonesia and Hong Kong as well, just in the past quarter alone. So part of it is, of course, word of mouth that as businesses establish and they search, they can find the Femtech Association. What's also exciting is that we're seeing a few of our Femtech Association of Asia brands now expanding their their companies into our surrounding Southeast Asia companies out of Singapore. So starting to work with Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, etc., which is really exciting to see. And I think it shows great momentum in um, kind of building um, you know, Asia founded with Asia founders, you know, for, for this market, as opposed to just bringing in, you know, companies from other markets, which we really, you know, want to also encourage is, you know, the women here to create their businesses for, you know, for our communities here. And going back to uh, your, what you were saying earlier, uh, when it comes to your findings, uh, do you see and and people opening people opening up more in in Asia. Do you see some differences in, for example, in in America and uh, like in Asia? Oof, that is a good question. Um, I think what we see, perhaps, because the U.S. really is right now the the largest femtech uh, representation of companies in the world. So we, we you know we can acknowledge that we're seeing so many more in 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 Europe where you guys are in Asia as well, the Middle East has some really mm-hmm. exciting companies, Africa as well. So, you know, we're definitely, and Australia has great representation. So we're seeing, you know, we're seeing a lot of momentum and growth. Now, when I look at the uh, Asia uh, compared to the, maybe some Western markets, I'd say the first thing that we like, see- I can a- imagine, sorry, Lindsay, I can imagine like for Asia, we're more like shy to, to open up about our concerns or, you know, like taboos you mentioned earlier about taboos or so many- I can imagine there's, I can just imagine there's so many more taboos in Asia than in America, maybe. So, I, I mean, I, I, I would, I would look to just, just quoting for Singapore alone, we're continuing to do mm-hmm. consumer market surveys in, in other markets. But for Singapore, we actually found that when we were looking at, when we offered participants in our survey, what were the top three most important elements for their healthcare or qualities for their healthcare? Discretion was on the list as one of the selections of the eight, and it actually came in number seven. So I I actually am not sure that women are as timid about their needs, especially I'm so excited about younger generations, you know, our millennial friends, our our younger generations, because I think there is um, some ownership and awareness of, of what we need. And we talk about it more openly. And I like saying we, like I'm a millennial and I'm not, but you know, I, I, like, to, I like to use the word we to feel young. We're so, being inclusive here. For everything. <laughs> but what we actually found with the three qualities uh, for, for participants of the survey in Singapore. So Singaporean women said that in order, the most important qualities for their healthcare cost was number one, trust and familiarity was number two, And convenience was number three. So again, discretion wasn't until number seven. So I think depending on markets, I mean, I've I've heard from our members in the Philippines that it's a bit more conservative there. So sometimes um, there's a lighter touch with some of the sexual health discussions and making sure it's more uh, reproductive or fertility based versus kind of sexual satisfaction based, for instance. So um, and that's from those members, obviously not my experience. I haven't lived in the Philippines, so I can't speak to that. But, you know, hearing hearing these types of differences are interesting. I would say when it comes to the actual business side, um, we do have more pre-seed level businesses here. So smaller companies being established right now. And so the funding requirements or requests, I should say, are lower still. We do have a few businesses that have raised over a million. There are three I can think of and one raised over five million that are paying attention to women's health and focusing on women's health. 
Um, but we do see most at the pre-seed stage. And I think that is different than seeing these amazing unicorns like we see kind of in the U.S. with the Maven Clinic, for instance, and some other brands that are growing really, really phenomenally. So we hope to get there and I believe we will get there. Um, but as far as you know, the consumer here, I think very savvy, um, very aware of their needs. And hopefully one thing I would say is that we move Femtech out of the premium space and into a more mass market solution. Maybe just a bit of an interesting question. So you mentioned uh, the business side of things. So ultimately, Femtech is another type of tech. The way you described it, it's more focused on specific needs. That's really what set it apart. The specific industry in itself. Now, what are some common, I would say, challenges that these businesses face from a business angle in Asia. I'd be very interested to understand that a little bit. So I'm sure when they come together, they share these type of things. Um, maybe less about the user for a second, but really the, 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 the femtech businesses themselves. What are they struggling with the most in the region, in your opinion? It's, it's a really good question. The two things that come up the most are the marketing and social media restrictions and the funding challenge. So let me start with social media. So over the years, uh, we've noticed that women's body parts cannot be shown or even use the words in a lot of instances based on social media policies. We're seeing change there and that's positive. So, you know, an example would be, we can talk about some, some more male issues like erectile dysfunction can be used, but we can't use, you know, the words for women's bodies. So I find that very interesting, but we are seeing change there as women are demanding that they want to be aware of what's out there for solutions. So that information also, mm -hmm. you know, I, I say this and it sounds, you know, a little juvenile, but like, these aren't dirty words. These are body parts, you know, like it's, it's medicine, it's yeah. medical, it's science. So first of all, social media. The second thing that we could probably spend a bit more time on is the funding challenge. So here in Asia, 77% of VCs, yeah, I should say in Southeast Asia, excuse me, excuse me, in Southeast Asia, 77% of VCs do not have a female decision maker. So if we look at the fact of a female, uh, invest, a female founder in Femtech going into a room to discuss, you know, as, as LV, one of the, uh, the founder of LV who's based out of the UK, but she said she'd go into rooms and discuss a breast pump and it just would go over people's heads. You know, these, the gentlemen couldn't understand, mm -hmm. you know, what, what she was trying to explain and why the need was so great. So I think there's, there's already a bit of a hurdle in understanding whether it's the product or the actual issue at hand and why it is actually an issue. So I think that's a challenge is when you face a room uh, that might not be as diverse of uh, not as diverse and of an investor set it's it's a little bit tough that's a challenge secondly i think as a sorry no, please, Lindsay, please. i think as a strategy you can just make a list okay i'm going to a meeting and i'm meeting with this and this and this founders who are their wives okay <laughs> <laughs> and then <laughs> talk to their wives before or or, or girlfriends or partners I, yeah i definitely I, I definitely think that and, and you know i i think that would be a nice thing is making sure that that connection's there. I, I would <laughs> add to that, you know, there are also so many layers of this because, you know, it's such a personal, such a personal thing. And for me, for instance, if, if you know, what my issues might not be Jackie's issues, right? Or, mm -hmm. you know, so, so it's hard to say, well, my wife doesn't have that issue. And it's like, well, maybe you haven't talked about it. Maybe she hasn't discussed perimenopause with you. Maybe she hasn't even discussed mm -hmm. menopause with you because you're in the middle of having children. So you don't understand that. that so, and that's really what we find a lot of is like when in our survey, again, with mm -hmm. Singapore, when we asked what, uh, what women in Singapore knew the most about, they said menstrual health, mental health, and reproductive health. Well, those are all quite relevant to younger generations, aren't they? When we're talking about, you know, getting our period, uh, mental health, again, with our younger generations who, thank goodness, are coming along and really making that change and, and being vocal about their mental health needs. And then reproductive health, that's obviously at a certain age group. What women said they knew the least about menopause, chronic illness, and reproductive health and fertility. So we look at menopause and chronic illness, those do typically happen later in life um, or, or just later out of those childbearing years. So I, I think it really is a direct correlation between what people literally know about and don't know about. Mm -hmm. So I think the most important thing is that investors and, and VCs and, and, and anyone else make sure that they have women in the room, uh, that they have um, people from all over the world in the room, and that they really balance um, who their 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 decision makers are to make sure that we have that diversity to really see the opportunities where there are great opportunities. 
Yeah, that's that's a massive hurdle, right? Because ultimately, when you go raise funds, you're selling, right? And and unlike selling to the consumer, where you can really strike a chord, if you're gonna present to I don't know five, forty-year-old males, and and you try to capture their their you know their attention, and it's about something they know nothing about, yeah, I, I can see that. And do do you? And it's a problem, right? Because, because fundraising ultimately uh, is, I mean, cash is needed to, to grow the business and, and, and sometimes takes time, especially in this climate. Is, are there proactive actions being taken? Like, do you see changes happening? Uh, I, uh, good question. Um, the, the biggest change I think I've seen is, first of all, that investors, no matter what the you know, investor uh, uh, profile is, more and more investors are, and I'm talking VC investors at this age, are starting to see uh, the importance of, of, not that they didn't already, but I, there's more opportunity, mm -hmm. I think, to have femtech businesses come forward and women's wellness and women's health businesses coming forward, which is a lot of what we're doing with the Femtech Association of Asia is really showing the need, interviewing the consumers, you know, bringing that insight and really trying to bring the thought leadership to give people a different perspective. On, on what what merits investment. Um, yeah, so I think that's a big part of it. And then I would say also we're seeing a lot of activity. Uh, I can speak to Singapore on this part, a lot of angel activity. And I've had a number of angel investors reach out to me personally and say, I'm looking to invest. I have you know 10 to 25,000. I would like to put it into a women's health business. Do you have any recommendations for the types of businesses I should be looking at. Secondly, I wanna invest in Asia, and I feel like this is a really neat kind of intersection that I can get involved with, you know, technology, women's health, and Asia. I mean, I think we can all admit that Asia has, is just a really exciting place to be. There's a lot of growth here, uh, especially if we look at, you know, some of our developing markets and the entrepreneurial spirit that's coming out with incredible founders and entrepreneurs with some of, you know, the countries here. There's so much potential. And it's exciting to think not only is there potential from the founder perspective, huge population that has, has not been uh, served. It's, it's an underserved population. So, um, yeah, there's a, lot, there's a lot more to do here. Have you, have you thought about helping solve it like directly? Um, like creating a network of angels, for instance, and, and getting maybe the license to, to, to get, I don't know, 200 kick-ass, you know, angels on board that would support this. Is that something you've considered? It, it's, I feel like you're, you're in my mind. You're in my <laughs> mind. Um, so I, there, I mean, there are so many opportunities. And I think the fact that we don't have an accelerator for women's health here, there's an opportunity. We just found our first uh, fem uh, uh, women's health focused VC that's just setting up right now. And they're actually a member of ours, which is really exciting. But do I feel like there's more there's more room and more space for this? Yes, I do. And especially angel investing networks, which we have some wonderful, uh, actually female led angel investing networks here that are you know doing a lot of really great work in investment, not only in women's health, but looking at ed tech and um, kind of some, some other um, more kind of, I guess I'd say female focused or female expert areas, which is really exciting. So yes, to answer that question, but there's so much more I, I would love to do. I mean, one thing I'm really looking forward to is that we have the largest ever uh, women's health and femtech conference coming to Asia this month, and we've partnered on that. So the Femtech Association of Asia is the kind of Asia partner for the Women, Women's Health Innovation Summit, uh, which will be taking place in Singapore on the 22nd, and 23rd of March. And it's really exciting. It's like, this is our first regional massive <laughs> you know, conference for this, this industry. And, and we get to take part in bringing it here. So I'm just absolutely thrilled. So there's definitely more opportunity also in kind of event space and, and actually building, um, you know, knowledge share platforms for, for people. So I think it's taking the community digital. I, gosh, I mean, we could sit here and, and, and brainstorm all day, but I'm, I'm, I'm fairly certain the, uh, your, your audience mm -hmm. will, will want to break from me after that. <laughs> no, 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 no. I want to hear more, right? So, uh, so, so, Lindsay, if it were up to you, right, and everything went beyond your imagination, where will this be in five years? Like, oh wow! I mean, what's the limit? What's the what's the the, the ideal end state? Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, the ideal end state is our vision, which is to have available, accessible, affordable health care for all women across Asia. So I think that is obviously maybe not a five year plan, uh, but, you know, that's what we're working towards. It's it's knowledge, funding and solutions is, is really kind of how I see our our focus. Um, I would love to say that in five years we'll have built a strong enough ecosystem that mm -hmm. combines founders, professionals, investors, future founders, because I always like to think about that next generation, yeah. which has just such a wonderfully powerful voice. And I know I talk about it a lot, but that's really who's making change right now in this space. The, you know, the consumers making demands for, for options and ownership. Um, so I, I, what I'd love to see is, to answer your question, and where I'd love to focus my time and attention, is first of all on, on building some sort of advisory that we can actually not only be the gateway through our knowledge, but actually help businesses that are based here grow and help businesses overseas in the women's health and technology space and, and fem health and fem care space actually use our knowledge. We have all this knowledge in this network and we would love to offer that for people who want to come into market and actually build, um, you know, kind of build a broader ecosystem that isn't just about Asia, but broader. So that's the first thing. The second thing, as you say, is something around an accelerator or actually bridging that gap in, in funding. Yeah, very passionate about that and really would like to support that and, and make sure that we are you know, funding kind of these, these businesses of tomorrow, which definitely need, are needed today. Um, and then when I look at the, you know, what, what we're looking at, I, I really see B2B as critical. So how are we actually building employee care and employee benefits that are not general, but they're actually specific, mm -hmm. not only from the DEI and I perspective, but also women in particular, um, and those who identify as women and have women's health needs. So how are we actually providing um, workspaces that are conducive to women and their needs at different stages of life. It could be something as simply as put it, simple as putting a nurse a nursing room yeah. with a refrigerator to store breast milk. You know, it could be um, the fact that 59% yeah. of women in menopause say their health has negatively affected their work. And that was in Forbes magazine. So are we doing trainings that, you know, line managers actually understand that women of a certain age, brain fog is real, you know, exhaustion yeah. is real, uh, heightened states of anxiety are real. And there are like over other 40 or 30 other symptoms of menopause. So are we actually training and teaching people? And is this an integrated part of our inclusivity? So I think there's there's a lot here. Um, and and I, I do look for partners all the time, whether it's big pharma partners or like you mentioned, angel investing networks, whether it's partners like um, local private members clubs who help support me with event, sponsor, event space sponsorship mm -hmm. here or um, you know, kind of larger scale partners like, you know, Mangtas who are inviting Femtech to be a part of the Future of Technology podcast. I mean, this is what we need is this amplification and support. So I, I, I would just, that was a lot, a lot to digest, but you yeah. can see that my mind goes a million miles an hour and I only wish there were, there were I had more hands and probably a bigger brain. <laughs> and more time. And more time, and more time today. Yeah, 25 hours each day. Like I have a six month uh, old baby and uh, let me just say I do appreciate uh, like here in Europe with the establishments or the offices that have a special section for breastfeeding mothers or even restaurants that ha just have a diaper changing table that already <laughs> it's just a small thing. But for mothers like myself, it it's it, it, it's much appreciated. Absolutely. Well, first of all, congratulations, new mom. That's all. <laughs> Thank so, you. New mom, no sleep. Congratulations on your <laughs> terrible sleep. I hope you're enjoying it. Um, first thing. Second thing is on that, I would say it's nice to see changing tables, not only in the women's bathroom, but also the men's bathroom or the unisex bathroom or the shared yes. bathroom. So I think a lot of it is around um, when we look at women's health. I mean, I was really, <laughs> I wasn't surprised, but the fact that you know, in our survey in Singapore, I know I'm talking about a lot about Singapore, but that's where we did our survey. It's the first one, actually, we finished our Philippines uh, survey, so that'll be coming out next. But, you know, when we when we look at, at what women said, they said, you know, how do you treat your health care? What, what, what do you value about your health care or how do you treat it? And they said, our, our Singapore respondents said, almost half of them, sorry, I'm rambling on, almost half of our participants said that they treat their health as a priority, their health and wellness, so half. 9% said that their health comes after their family, their job, you know, like everything else. And you just think about like, that's not good. You know, a strong, um, strong health 
is, is what allows us to have great jobs or to uh, contribute more to our family or to take better care of our families and our communities. So I just, I, I don't like seeing that. And, and we do think a lot about caregiving and are we sharing the burden of caregiving? And, and part of Femtech is creating solutions that can save time, build knowledge um, and, and give options to women who have healthcare needs mm -hmm. or those who have health, women's healthcare needs so that they can you know, have it be more convenient in their day-to-day -day life. Exactly, and ultimately to be able to function well and to give more of yourself, you ultimately have to take care of yourself first and then you're able to take care very well of your family, of your business, of your job and everything, everything else. To, to, that, steal a, yeah, to steal a quote from my friend Rashmi, she always says the most important things for women are health and wealth. So how do we build those two things as women to ensure that we have options and can take care of ourselves, take care of our families, take care of our friends, take care of our communities. With good health and enough wealth, we certainly will be more successful in every way. Well said. But now, um, when uh, you talk about the consumer survey, Lindsay, you conducted a consumer, you're the first ever actually consumer survey for Singapore in, in 2022. Uh, and uh, you've been talking about your your learnings from that survey. Are there any other um, learnings that you would like to share or or point out? Absolutely, absolutely. So one thing I will definitely you know compliment um, Singapore on is is definitely being in touch with their with their citizens and with their community here. It, it, it's absolutely incredible to watch. So and and I should be a part of now that I'm now that I live here. <laughs> So it's, I have to say, you know, they do a wonderful job with surveys. So I would say, for, and, and just getting to know people. So I would say from our side, when we talk about our survey, it's definitely femtech specific, women's health specific consumer survey. So just to add some qualifiers there. Um, so I would say we talked a little bit about the qualities. We talked a bit about value. 74% um, of women in Singapore said healthcare is affordable. 94% said it's accessible. So it's wonderful to hear that people feel like they can access it. It might just cost a bit more than, than what they're expecting. 30% of women spend over $1,000 per year, and that's even with insurance, keep in mind. So this is an interesting market if we look at $1,000 minimum per, per woman per year, and how are, how are those funds being allocated? And can Femtech um, alleviate that from you know, the public hospital system, or the, excuse me, the hospital system? You know, can we help um, minimize resource? Um, can we, you know, create better tracking and trends in health that we can keep sight of to better understand what's going on in our bodies faster? Um, we see a very high level of trust in Singapore for our doctors and our medical professionals, which is wonderful to see, really wonderful to see. And then I would say kind of what are key concerns for women in market once we finished and kind of looked at all the responses as well as the um, qualified data, i.e. people who shared um, written responses as well. Gaps in holistic healthcare. So people, a lot of women felt like they'd go to one place for one thing, another doctor for something else. They weren't really sure that people were looking at their entire healthcare regime. And that would also include, you know, exercise programming and, and diet and all of these things as well, nutrition. Uh, limited budgets. So obviously a challenge is always finances and making sure that we have enough money a lack of knowledge. So sometimes we just don't know. We don't know what to ask or we don't know that that's not normal. You know, PCOS has been taking five to seven years to diagnose with that pain. And maybe women sometimes just think everyone has that pain, but not everyone does. You know, so we don't know what's normal or not. We only know our bodies. And I shouldn't say normal. I should say average. And then data privacy and, and just also, you know, fundamentally tech overload. How many apps do we all have on our phone? So the question is, how can we really simplify the healthcare journey for our femtech consumers? And so going back to what we were talking about early, uh, earlier, so many of the femtech businesses, you know, a challenge is how do we ensure that people, do, uh, that our consumers don't have to go to several places, they can just get as much done on our app or with our, our um, company as possible. That's definitely a thought process that our, um, that our companies go through. That's, that's, that's excellent insight. And, and well, you mentioned something that, that triggered a question in my mind. Mm -hmm. So um, we went quite deep into, let's say, the domain, right? Like the, the, the industry in itself and all that. And, and, but you touched upon uh, like tech uh, and data privacy and all that. So something that I'm personally interested in is, is there something unique about Femtech 
when you build solutions that tech people need to be aware of. Like we have a lot of tech listeners, for instance, like when they're building solutions for that space, are there specific new ones, challenges that are quite unique to that? Does something come to mind, Lindsay, when, with this question? <laughs> well, I mean, as you're speaking, obviously being from the US originally, I, I, I look at Roe versus Wade, I'm sure, you know, reading about all of that. And I think, gosh, I mean, talk about data being used in a way that to me um, is difficult with crossing lines of privacy. And so when we talk about privacy, I think a lot of it is around confidentiality. And so people want their everyone, everyone, men, women, any, you know, everyone um, want their 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 healthcare data to be theirs and to be private to them, to be anonymized if it's being used and not you know put against their names. So I think it's no different than anything else that we want to own our data and control who's using our data and how. And so I would say for femtech businesses, having strong data policies, privacy policies, terms and conditions, um, and making sure we adhere to those and those are reviewed regularly, mm -hmm. incredibly important. And also the robustness that you that you call out water of the systems. It's making sure that the actual systems being used are adhering to those privacy policies and following, you know, the same level of um, data protection that we see in Europe with GDPR, or I guess it's the Data Protection Act now. So I think the confidentiality and just the vulnerability of someone feeling like their data could be shared is, is the most important thing and making sure that regular checks of, of data and the systems we use are critical. Okay, awesome. And uh, you know, you have the data, we sit in the time and the age where we have a lot of data to, to back things up. It's just there at um, for, for us to, I mean, for, for you to learn, to learn mm -hmm. from, but not, not abuse, of course. And, uh, you know, earlier I loved how you referred to data when I said, I can only imagine that, you know, for people in Asia, they're a bit shy about things, but that's not the case because data shows that it's actually the cost that they're more concerned about or the trust issue or the, or the convenience. So, you know, we think in Singapore, this... in Singapore, yes, in Singapore, in Singapore yes, yeah, <laughs> indeed, indeed, soon, soon you'll be doing your surveys across uh, more exactly. countries in Southeast Asia and you'll uh, you just yeah. know more about how to help actually. I love yeah. what you just said, though, because you definitely just highlighted something that is so critical. And that's really, I think just the fact that like, we think of Asia, and we just think of this massive continent. And yeah. just the, the, the differences of the consumers, the businesses, the, you know, the level like you were talking about a second ago, the level of data security policy, like, just it, there's, they, these are such different cultures, languages, um, uh healthcare systems insurance systems you know these are they're all so mm -hmm. different so i think it's really exciting to think about the personalization and localization that femtech can solve you know and, and that business is scaling also talking about challenges one of the challenges is oh my goodness moving from singapore to anywhere else or indonesia to anywhere else or vietnam to anywhere else or china to anywhere else they're all so <laughs> different so it's like re it's really needing to have a, a you know, a, a, a localized solution and, and being ready to have a million different iterations of, of what's being delivered based on the needs of each country and, and consumer. 100%. So, so basically, so Jackie and I met each other over 25 years ago in the Philippines, coincidentally. So we are actually are, we're both originally from the Philippines and I live myself in probably five different Southeast Asian countries. Amazing. Um, and I can tell you, Singapore and Philippines are not going to be the same. Right. <laughs> exactly. Be, exactly. It's be very, very interesting. I look forward to, to reading their core challenges. But I remember growing up in the Philippines, uh, taboo is, is serious, right? Um, especially on these type of topics. So, yeah, no, really, really powerful stuff you're doing and really bringing that to light is very important. Thank you so much. Yeah, really looking forward to sharing more. And I, I, again, if I had more hands, I would do more because I'm so passionate about the space and I have so much information to share. It's just finding the time to actually, you know, put the pen to paper or create this, <laughs> create the social media post or have the meeting with the investor or have the meeting with the new member and welcome them. We just welcomed another new member today. You know, I mean, it, it's it's 
we all have this, I think, though, in the entrepreneurial space. In femtech is no different from every other tech business that's just starting off, is that there's so much to do, so many people to catch up with, so many podcasts to be on, <laughs> you know? So at the end of the day, it's really just doing our best to maximize our time and where we're going to have the greatest impact towards achieving our vision, again, of that available, affordable, and accessible healthcare for all women. Awesome. And you're so, I love how you're so passionate about what you're doing, Lindsay. And you already said that you, you, you want like building these communities and it's so great how you're having fun, but at the same time, you're creating so much impact and uh, helping so many women and so many people in uh, what you do. So kudos Thank you. to Thank you. you. <laughs> and for for businesses or organizations or even individuals who would like to get involved or get in touch with you, how can they best uh, reach you or where can they best find you? Yeah, thank you for asking. So, you know, we, we welcome everyone to contact us, even if it's just a simple question about thoughts or to have a discussion or a coffee, a virtual coffee at that. So, <laughs> you know, we are mostly on LinkedIn is actually where we try to really build our community because we feel that that is a wonderful way to kind of, again, bridge that consumer, uh, business, founder and investor, you know, kind of create the platform to connect all of those and unify those groups. Um, so LinkedIn is probably best. We also do yeah. have a small Instagram page, but don't spend as much time on it. Everyone's welcome to reach out to Lindsay Davis on LinkedIn as well. I always welcome new connections, especially people, again, passionate about women's health and technology. Um, yeah. And anyone who's just curious about, you know, living in Asia, creating a business and building a business in Asia, scaling a business. Of course, if it's about the Philippines, I'll defer to you, too. So maybe you'll have some <laughs> some people contacting you as well. But, you know, I just I love meeting people and I love trying to create something for um, individuals I feel so passionate about, which is, you know, women and those with women's health care needs. And I think there's a lot of room for growth and a lot of room for change, ownership, options. Um, and, and the next generation of founders to come in and make huge impact alongside the founders we already have today who are really, you know, starting that momentum and, and have just absolute talent. So, you know, thank you so much. This, is, this has been so great chatting with you guys. <laughs> I love talking with other people who have spent significant time in this part of the world um, and, and also in Europe. So we, we have some things in common where we've lived. And just really thank you for amplifying and helping me amplify this message around, you know, inspiring collaboration to build the women's health and technology or femtech community globally. Awesome. And well, the pleasure, the pleasure is all ours, Lindsay. Thank you. Thank you for spending time with us today in the, in the midst of busy schedule to help share and spread the word about femtech. And uh, well, just to, to put a pin on it, this, there's also different avenues or different social media platforms for different countries in Asia. You can, I, again, I can just imagine that for other Asian countries, uh, other social media platforms, the more active on other social media platforms rather than... Yeah, uh, Facebook LinkedIn, is Google. For Facebook example. can be Google in some places, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's, that should be part of, uh, it'll eventually form part of your future surveys or it is already a part of it. <laughs> That's right. I know. See, that's what I'm saying. Endless <laughs> ideas. There are so many ideas out there. Awesome. Well, um, thank you once again, Lindsay, for taking the time to be with us today. Your insights have been incredibly valuable. And again, we think that all the work that you do for women in tech is just absolutely awesome. So again, thank you from, thank from you. us. Thank you, you so much for luck. having me. Thank you so much for having me. Have a great 2023 and let's definitely catch up if you're on this side of the world or if I'm on that side of the world, we'd love to meet you guys in person too. I'm, I'm actually in Singapore, Lindsay. So, oh, well, there, uh, you there you go. We should be doing this together. I'll, uh, yeah. I'll call your, uh, your, your bluff. There you go. There you go. <laughs> I'll, I'll invite you for a coffee. Definitely. Very soon. Lovely. I'd love oh, that. I'll take the virtual one. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you, guys. Oh, Have a great all day. All right. So, um, well, listeners, uh, it's a wrap for today's episode of Monk Das Nation. Thanks for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed the conversation and learned something new. And we promise to be back next time with another episode. Once again, this is Jackie DeMink. And Wouter Dalbare. And stay tuned for the next episode of Monk Das Nation. Thank you for tuning in to Mangtas Nation. Mangtas, your curated marketplace for B2B outsourcing solutions. 
follow our social media pages to know more about us. Sign up as a client or sign up as a vendor and be part of this global B2B marketplace. Join us at www.mangtas.com. <laughs>